Welcome back live to our live stream audience. Brandy tells me we hit almost 400 and then we steadied out at about 140 or 150 online, um, which is good. The last four years, I had my grandson tally up last night. Um, there have been over 53,000 views of the after the session posted videos. So that's a small city, isn't it? Actually, it's a pretty good sized city, bigger than Lake Tahoe, so good job. Konnichiwa. Hello. Good eye. Wait for some people to come in and find their seats. Our next speaker is a repeat. She likes it so much she volunteered to come back. <laughs> She's also joined our Sunday and Wednesday meetings at our little branch church by telephone on occasion, shared testimonies with us. So that sort of outreach continues as well. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Fujiko Signs from Tokyo, Japan. Bios, by the way, I don't read bios because I don't like to stand here and read to you. I assume because you're here you've or you're online watching, you've been online and you've read the bios that are posted. So I don't need to tell you about them. So with no further ado, Fujiko, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Well, I love the last talk by Beth, and I'm sure you did too, because what she said about that underlying principle is love. That love is moving, growing, changing, transforming all of us, including here in South Lake Tahoe, you have spring. <laughs> and the underlying principle that making these plants to grow the the uh, you know, the seeds to germinate to really change the surface. Um, the, the beauty of all these flowers is really love. Is this okay? Okay. And then I, I learn a lesson from beautiful sister like Beth, but also we learn a lesson from nature as well. Well, I want to share that one day I was looking at these beautiful bouquet of flowers, and I noticed that the bumblebee was looking at the same book. Uh, bouquet as well. When I just looked at the bumblebee, not afraid that it was going to, you know, harm me or anything because he's probably busy thinking of his own job, you know, work to do. But it really dawned on me at that time, we were looking at the same flowers, but is he seeing the same thing as the way I see these, these flowers? And thanks to science, as you know, in biology you have learned because the structure of the eye is different with the insects. It's a whole different multiple lenses. What they see is more of the infrared shape or the light. What I see as flowers is different from what the bumblebees are seeing. So then the next question came to me. What is the reality of the flowers? What is the reality that we live in? What are we depending on to determine what reality is? If the reality is in the eye of, no, the eye of the beholder, did I say it right? Yeah. yeah, sometimes I flip it. The eye of the beholder, then the reality depends on that eye. And this lecture's title is God's Eye View of You. What, we, what if we had an eye that is so pure, so harmonious, loving, and that lens is going to obliterate anything that is not loving, lovable. And it's something that really made me think, this must be the eye that God sees through. You know, in the Bible, we have different um, verses that really made us think about this. Here it says in the Old Testament, in Habakkuk, it says, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity. And in other places, I found out that, you know the phrase, you're the apple of my eye? I used to think that was just a phrase, you know, from the pop song, a love song. 
was actually in the Bible. It says here in Deuteronomy, it says, He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. And in the, in the Psalms, it says, Show your marvelous loving kindness, O you that save by your right hand them which put their trust in you from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. The phrase, you keep me as the apple of your eyes. You know, one of the things that we do as the student of Christian science is that we think about it and we ask questions. Beth was saying it's okay to ask. We just don't take anything, you know, like swallow whatever other people say. The question that came to me after reading these two verses was, were there apples in the Middle East when this verse was written? <laughs> so what do I do? Apples? Putting in your eyes? That sounds a little too, too big, you know. So I looked it up. In the Hebrew text, it says, the very same verse, it says, you kept me as a child of my eye, of your eye. You kept me as a child. You protect me, protected me as a child of your eye. It really occurred to me, when we love someone, we tend to look into that person's eye. Except I was told, Navajos don't like that. So don't do that with the Navajo Nation people. But when we're looking and trying to take care of children, don't we keep our eyes on the child or children? And what's reflected in our eyes? The children, the child. And you know, no matter how big a person standing in front of me, uh, maybe six foot five um, football player, when that person is reflected on my eye, how big is it? This big or small. You know, when everything is reflected on God's eye, there's nothing too big, nothing too scary, nothing too fearful. And I just felt like, wow, in the middle of the eye is called pupil. I don't know whether it's a coincidence. There's a little pupil in your eye. And I'm very curious. Just like, oh, it really dawned on me. In Japanese, we use Chinese character for pupil. And sure enough, it consists of two parts for the pupil. It has radical eye, and next to it is, you can guess, a child. It must be universal. And I love these ideas, connecting these dots to see that if we really know that when we love someone, when we are caring for someone, and if you think of so-called parent taking care of us, we are reflected on that eye. Christ Jesus, who taught us about truth that makes us free, understood this concept because he called God my father or our father that made him a child. He knew that he was constantly within that view of God that is knowing all inf infinite, powerful, knowing not only just any old thing, but good always. Powerful good that transforms our lives to find solutions that we need. Very practical. And you know, when I read these um, verses, like, you kept me as the apple of your eye, don't, don't you feel like warmth in your heart? You know, those people who wrote this felt that warmth, that I am protected by much higher power, that infinite, the sustaining infinite that Beth was reading from the, the first line in the preface of Science and Health, with key to the scriptures that we learned that Mary Baker Eddy wrote from her own experience and through prayer. The reason we also feel warmth is because we connect with that author through this verse, not the words, but the thought and the feeling behind it that made that person write this. And I call this 
connection, that spiritual consciousness, knowing the much higher consciousness, which is God. We tend to think that we learn things and stuff our brain to keep us smarter, but we have this so-called consciousness. And even in science, we're really learning there's a difference between brain and consciousness. And when I say consciousness today, I'm talking about spiritual consciousness that connects us to this father, mother, God. That nurturing sense of mother, father, God, you can put it all of them together as a nurturing parent. And so that's the same thing had happened when Mary Baker Eddy had that near fatal accident. And when she recovered from reading that healing account of Christ Jesus, that shift in consciousness had taken place. And that's not a brain learning because even a child or an animal or a plant, they can feel this connection with the higher sense of life that she recovered knowing and feeling. She needed to understand later through studying the Bible. The next three years, it says, she de delved deeply to understand and what I call to connect the dot. And what she really experienced was, is what in the dictionary we can find this word epiphany. Epiphany means a sudden intuitive realization of insight into reality. She saw this reality completely different from matter-bound, matter-feared, matter material law-based reality to, to totally spiritual, governed by spirit, as an image and likeness of God. The very first chapter we just learned that we are made in the image and likeness of God. When we, when we think about this image, if I ask you to have an image of the flowers that's about to bloom, or maybe in the summer months, you can really have that image in your thought, can't you? Can I touch it? It stays within you. When God made you in the image and likeness of himself, it stays within this parent, God. God's seeing. You're seeing in your own self a certain image. An image stays there. And it's very important in the study of Christian science to have this understanding. Is man is not somehow manufactured year after year. Year, year after year, like that God is a uh, um, you know, factory um, director, like, okay, this year we're going to produce this many people. That doesn't make sense. It only took one utterance, let there be man, like let there be light, to have all man created in the image and likeness of God. We tend to see it through chronological sequences, like I was born here and then grandfather was born there. But that's our material sense of things that tries to calculate and see God not as infinite, as somehow material men manufacturing us. That image and likeness stays with us. And at the end of the first chapter of Genesis, it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. He saw it. Just like you see in your own thought, your image, and where it says, behold, what's the meaning of behold? To see. Behold, it was very good. That's the basis of the, the Christian science, the science part. Mary Baker Eddy has said science in a very s small booklet called No NES. She says, science is that which reveals and interprets God and man. And about Christian, science is the, the noun. She, she's saying, what kind of science is this? She's saying, it's Christian science. And to that, in the same booklet, No and Yes, she says, Christian is the highest style of man. Isn't that wonderful? 
That's what we are trying to strive to achieve, to become the highest style of man. And of course, she's thinking of the man Christ Jesus who taught us. And that whole underlying the purpose of healing in his ministry was love. That's the divine principle behind it. Mary Baker Eddy explains about Christ Jesus. She's, he's, she says, Jesus beheld in science the perfect man who appeared to him where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. In this perfect man, the Savior saw God's own likeness, and this correct view of man healed the sick. Now, how many times I have said something similar to, to see? At least three times. Beheld in science, a perfect man, right? In perfect man, the Savior saw and this correct view. And if we can really have this correct view for one another, we can see each other's perfection. And when I say perfect, it doesn't mean that you have to be just perfectly made up or you know, had a, your hair set per perfectly or look handsome or dress beautifully. Perfect, again, in the dictionary means complete, done, and finished. Remember, you were already made in the image and likeness. Nothing can touch you. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken away. When a perfect music is composed, the composer step back and say, I'm done, because it's perfect. Every single one of you is perfect. And I'm learning this more and more through experience. And sometimes in the places where I would not even expect to, viewing and admiring the bouquet of flowers. But one time I was um, asked to speak uh, in India Mumbai, India, for the nursing students. This is a medical nurse um, school. And as I was speaking about how the Lord's Prayer can help all the nurses who are day in and out going into the, the, the room, the person, patient is, is, uh, is uh, needing some help, can use the ideas in the Lord's Prayer. Um, while I was speaking and sharing, one of the instructors raised her hand and she said, may I share something? And I, I said, yes, please go ahead. And she said, well, about 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with a cancer in pancreas in the latter stage, stage four, she said. And I was so devastated. I just felt so depressed and sad. But around the time, she was also uh, invited to go to relatives uh, gathering, and she thought this is a perfect time because I'm not going to tell anyone about my illness, but I will see them for the last time in my life. Because she was told that she will only have a couple months to live. Well, she was sitting in the corner of her, this cheerful gathering. One niece noticed that she was not herself, not her jovial self, and came to her and said, Auntie, what's wrong with you? And you know, Auntie looked at her and said, didn't want to mention anything about the name of the illness. She said, well, Auntie has something dark inside, something bad inside me. And you know what? This girl looked at her straight in her eyes and said, no, Auntie, you don't have anything bad or dark inside you. She hugged her and left quickly to play with her cousins. And on the way home, this instructor said she was in the bus recalling this experience and remembering the way she looked at her. And with this same sense of conviction, there was nothing in her that was dark or bad. The next medical checkup that she had it was very soon after this experience. Doctors took time trying to see her after an examination. And she thought, well, surely this has really grown and becoming worse. Well, they all came to the room and says, well, I need to explain something. We cannot explain from the medical stand of, standpoint of view, point of 
standpoint, but we cannot find your cancer. And they said, she was dismissed. And the, not only that, that cancer disappeared, but the, these doctors was in awe. They never even asked her to come back for further checkup. <laughs> and to her, as a medical nurse instructor, that part was more miraculous than the fact that the cancer had disappeared. Well, in the Bible, we read in the New Testament in James, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? It's asking the source. If the source is one, can that same source produce something sweet and bitter, light and darkness? Can they be in the same place? Well, Mary Baker Eddy has, some, has something to say about this. She says, Spirit and its formations are the only realities of being. Matter disappears under the microscope of spirit. She had experienced this. When the scientists, material, you know, phys physical scientists, look through the microscope, they are looking for material evidences. And sometimes they know the, the outcome. They might be discovering certain things. When metaphysicians or metaphysical scientists, those who really lean on that sustaining infinite, look through the microscope of spirit, she's saying matter disappears. Well, her sense of reality was always one, not duality. There was no sense of good and bad mixed together to make the reality, our reality. But Mary Baker Eddy understood that the only view we must have as Christ Jesus had done it in his ministry to see that through one eye, the God's eye, the pure eye that cannot behold any iniquity. She also gave this wonderful statement. It's called, a scientific statement of being. It really explains that there is no life, truth, intelligence, nor sub no substance in matter. All is infinite mind, mind written with capital M, and it's infinite manifestation. Remember when I said you are made in the image and likeness? That's the consciousness, divine mind is where you stay, and she's saying, all is infinite mind and it's infinite manifestation. For God is all in all. That all in all is the one reality, the spiritual reality. And all in all covers the distance and time. If there's something in the past in your life that had made you feel a victim or a cause of some problems that you're incurring right now, we can obliterate by seeing through this microscope of spirit. Because it not only through transcending time, but also space. You know, if I am, as an example actually, Beth is, was praying for her daughter, and she was not right there, there was this distance. The physical distance is actually part of that all in all, it really encompasses. If love is real here, where her daughter was, Love is real there too. In fact, everything that has connected us, past and present, the only thing that we know is love connecting us. And I had this experience um, when I was staying in Tokyo and my husband and my daughter were in a remote place in China. They were going out in, a, in you know, places where they were going to experience something pretty wild and primitive. Um, I was in Tokyo helping my parents, doing my grocery, when I received my text. And it was a text from my daughter, from her cell phone. It said, help, pray, Papa is in pain. That's it. And it stopped. There was nothing more. There's no explanation why he was in pain and why I had to pray. I dropped everything that I was carrying, my grocery. 
found a bench and sat down. And I thought of this exact idea that all in all is where my husband is, where my daughter is. There is no gap where I am, where God is, where God is with them. So I just thought maybe I'll just text a few things for, back to them. And soon I receive another call, a text which said, Papa is fine, <laughs> the end of it. I think after that, they went into this wilderness without any uh, cell phone um, signals. So I didn't hear it until they came back to Japan when they explained to me that my husband had eaten something that made him have the symptoms of food poison. And he is, he's sitting in the back, he's six foot four, very tall, but he was in perspiring, in pain, you know, um, squatting down like a little ball, and was in pain, obviously in pain. So that's why my daughter texted me. I found out that soon after my daughter texted me, my husband sprang up and said, it's gone. It was so sudden that really made him really stood up and say, it's gone. And later when I asked him, how did it feel? He said, it felt like somebody punched his stomach and something just left. That was his experience. That was his probably first instantaneous uh, healing. And it really made me think that all in all, knowing that there's only one view helps us to see that there is no space or gap that God is not. Every space is governed by the Spirit. Well, in the Bible, in another place, Jesus gives this instruction. He says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. He says, the light of the body is the eye. And it says, not the eyes, it says the eye. If therefore thine eye be single. And I, I read the Bible in Japanese too. In the Japanese Bible, it's translated as when your eye is simple and pure, your whole body shall be full of light. So I went to the source, the original word, and it had all three meanings, single, pure, and simple. Hmm? Simple, single, and pure. All these three things. And it's so important for me that this Bible translation chose the word single because it really made sense when Mary Baker Eddy said, if you see through the microscope of spirit, we will see matter disappear. So here it says the light of the body is the eye. The darkness is going to be shut away. There is no darkness. Like that niece talking to the ant, intuitively she knew that was not the true nature of this auntie. And it's so universal. Sometimes I find this science is so applicable anywhere, even if they may be Hindi or Buddhist or I come from Japan, so people reading this textbook in the Bible having um, healing, even if their religious background may be completely different from Christianity. They feel that Mary Baker Eddy made, it, made the teachings and the words in the Bible accessible to them. And if you're a Buddhist, they become better Buddhist. If they're Jewish, they become better Jewish, you know? I think it's just deep understanding that our oneness with this Father, which is all good, never changes. Another thing that really came to me to look up was this word, I. Therefore, then, then thy, your I be single, this I. Remember earlier I was reading from James, from the same fountain, the sweet and bitter water will not come out. And by the way, have you ever mixed sweet and bitter water and tried to drink it? No matter how many sugar you put, if it's a drop of bitter, it's going to be bitter. So we better not put any bitterness. This fountain, the word translated as fountain, 
turn out to be the same word as the word used here that Jesus is saying, when your eye be single. Why do you think this eye and fountain are the same word? It's actually very <laughs> simple because we're not really aware of it, but you have fountain in your eye. Did you know, did, do you know that? Right? Without the fountain, it's going to be very dry. It's called tear. Is it called duct? Tear duct. It seemed like every word that we read in the Bible, if we read it with spiritual sense, appealing to our spiritual consciousness, there's something more than just the words. That is what really teaches us. When we say the word with dub, uh, capital W, we don't mean that the certain words have an effect or the power to heal. It's the thought behind that word that made that person feel that infinite, sustaining God that holds the universe in the right place. You know, we're at certain distance from the, the, the sun, and we think it's kind of a coincidence, or we're just lucky. We cannot be a little even closer or further just to have these beautiful seasonal um, beauty in front of us. We have to see that principle is underlying love that keeps us in the right place. And every single part of us, the idea within us, whether it's I, you know, but we think that we're made up of parts, like we have to take ourselves to a mechanic once in a while to check, have a checkup or, you know, tune up. But if you understand that the whole body shall be full of light, if we see it through God's eye view. So I am kind of trying to make you know, enough time for the next speaker and also the Q&A. But I'm going to share one more healing. Um, this, is, this healing is from Korea. When I was living in Pennsylvania, and I put my name in a public um, place, which we got to make me accessible to anyone who would like to call me to have um, healing solutions through prayer, I receive a call from Korea. And I knew this person who called from Korea because he was a Christian scientist and had asked me in the past if I, was a, if I could travel to Seoul, Korea. I would come for his friend, actually an in-law. Well, this in-law, um, was struggling with cancer and came to America to the best research hospitals in Houston and in New York and returned and, told, and was told that there's nothing more they could do. And right before he fell into the state of coma, this Christian scientist gentleman asked this man, the in-law, can we call a Christian science practitioner? And as he was falling into the state of unconsciousness. He said yes. So he called, and next day I found uh, the ticket, and I flew over to Seoul, Korea. And that was middle of winter, and I had my ugly boots. They swept me from the airport straight to the, the room where this gentleman was lying down. And this man put all the family members out in the waiting room, and it was all, all alone with this man, and the only thing I was told was that, that he had this claim of cancer, but he also spoke Japanese. He had education in Jap Jap Japan, so I could communicate with him in Japanese. I'm in this dark room in the middle of the night. I'm sitting there looking at him. Nothing is moving about him. I close my eyes and ask God, why am I here? What am I to do? And the only thing I knew for sure from the very beginning is that this family loved, loved him so much to bring me all, you know, from, from all the way from Pennsylvania to Seoul. That was one thing that I knew for sure, that there is love here. But I closed my eyes. I said, I need to really know 
how to really think and see. And the first kind of loud in my own consciousness, an idea came to me. It says, see what I see. And at first, I was kind of puzzled. See what I see. And I knew this I has to be God. See what I see. Well, I thought if I is life, I am going to see life in him and activity, movement, and all that life brings, the beauty in him. First, my eyes were closed. I opened my eyes and I thought, well, if God is love, there's love in him. Love is loving him, but also there's love in him that wants to live. There's life in him like that. Soon, I heard a little rustling in the, on the bed, and I opened my eyes, and I saw him looking at me. And he said something in Korean. So I said in Japanese, I am Fujiko. I came from Pennsylvania, but I'm Japanese. Mr., you know, your in-law invited me to be here. And he started to speak in Japanese very slowly. Ah, Fujiko-san. And the first thing he said was, where is my family? <laughs> so I said, they're out at waiting outside. And he says, I want to see my daughter. And the next thing he said was, I want to walk. So I said, I will go get her. Just wait. And I just rushed out, got the daughter. And the daughter was you know, in awe, in tears. We both enter into the, his room. And he's already sitting at the end of the, the edge of the bed, looking for his slippers. And he said he wants to walk. So the daughter on one side of him and myself on the other, we stood up. He started to walk towards the door. And we walked the entire ward of this very big hospital. And there were at least four nursing stations. All the nurses were popping up their heads. And they were really surprised. I didn't say anything. We just walked quietly. He was so happy. He came back to the room. And he just asked me, perhaps you need to go home and sleep. I said, yes. <laughs> so that's what I did. Well, next day when I returned, he asked me whether I prayed. And I said, yes. And you know, he said, but Fujiko-san, I am Confucian. I'm not a Christian. I said, well, but I still prayed. And he started to look around the room and said, where did you pray to? I don't see any statue. And I said, Mr. Cho, I don't need a statue. My God is everywhere, and it is also your God. It's God within you and me. And he looked a little puzzled, but he seemed to accept it. And he said, is there any prayer that I can learn? So I thought, well, there's a man called Christ Jesus. And he said, yes, I know him. <laughs> there's a prayer that he gave us. I am going to make sure that we have the Lord's Prayer in Korean. And he said, he called his sons and was like, Go get the big paper. We're going to put the Lord's Prayer in Korean and put it in my room. So by the afternoon, we had this long paper you know, you, with a thick marker. He made sure it was right in front of him that he was reciting, trying to remember. Well, he asked me another question, maybe the third day. And he's well by the, this time. There was nothing that they actually they were going to do because they kind of given up on him. I found out that the cancer was in his, his thigh, and he had not walked for nearly one year. But the very first thing he wanted to do was to walk. And because I didn't really know what, what his limitation was, I thought, sure, you're going to walk. And he showed he could walk. And you know, third day he asked me, now that I'm here, what am I supposed to do? I built three big companies. I gave it to my two sons and my son-in-law. What's the purpose in my life? 
I looked at him and said, what came to me was, well, Mr. Cho, your job, your new job is to love. And he, he kind of chuckled, like, to love? That's a job? <laughs> yes, that's the only job you have. And so the next time nurse came to, to bring him food, he says, well, I know this is a really hard job. I know you're not wearing a, a wedding ring. Would you like me to find your husband? <laughs> yeah. And the next nurse came for something else, and he said, this is a really hard job. Can I find you a job in my company? Much better paid than here. And they were dumbfounded because I found out later when he was in pain and in fear, he was yelling at these nurses, hitting them. He was the nastiest person that you can ever imagine. And he started to say thank you to everything that they were saying. And you know, the ones who were most surprised were his family members. Because I found out in their entire life, knowing him, he had never said thank you. He never said delicious to the meal that his wife cooked. Never once. The children have heard it. So that was a big transformation. So one day, maybe it was the fourth day, I asked him, Mr. Cho, what did you want to always become when you were a boy? Because I'd like you to think about it. When the challenges are really heavy in our lives, what was it as a child that you aspire to be? What was the purity and the desire and love that you have as a child? So when I asked him, he said, well, I always wanted to become an artist. I wanted to become a painter. And I said, well, maybe then you can not now. And he said, isn't it too late? My father had died prematurely, very young. I was the oldest of a whole clan, not just your own family, but in Korea, they take care of the whole clan. He was the oldest of, of anyone there. So he said he stopped thinking about art. He went to work, got his degree, and just became this fear, fierce businessman. He said, that's what I have to do. And I said to him, well, from now on, you're done with this business thing. You're going to be an artist. And again, he's calling the driver. You go get all the art supply. I'm going to start. You know, he's very receptive. He, whatever I had said, he would immediately practice, just like calling the nurse you know, about finding someone to marry. But that was a form of love that he remembered. But gradually, his heart started to melt, and he could speak with his children. And they were really finding the father that he, they had never known. And he was love itself. I didn't know him before that all these things had happened. Well, one day I visited him in his room. He had all these uh, desks, and I, I call it desks, sketching. And the hand, you know, he had all the flowers, fruit baskets to, to draw. The hand was that of professional artist. He, it did not have to take time for him to really express who he was. When you think about God made us to express him in the way that will bring joy, that was not hidden or taken away. It was still there with him. So I, I thought it was a really proof that all is infinite mind and it's infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. I was there to witness this one man, a Korean man, who said he was, you know, Confucian, being able to express that joy. And I like to share this because it is not that somehow I had mentally tried to manipulate him to wake up or to become someone nicer than who he was. I had no idea. The only thing that took place was I turned my thought to God, that God that is 
present in every trouble, was right there, as Beth has really explained you know, perfectly in the previous lecture. So he was right there, that oneness. That oneness was always there with him from his childhood. And the child that, was, that really desired to be artist is still there. So that one reality that we're living is something that we need to be conscious of. Mary Baker Eddy says something here very important. Um, she says, consciousness constructs a better body when faith in matter has been conquered. And now I'm talking about consciousness. The spiritual consciousness is constructing body, not the material laws, hereditary laws, or the world thought, seasonal things that we have to somehow catch, a certain age that we have to certain lose or gain. Um, that's not what we are going to be uh, subjecting our body to. It says consciousness constructing a better body every time we're turning to God and losing this faith in matter. That faith in matter also brings back again to that oneness, one reality. And I'm not saying there are two realities that we go back and forth between. It's just like when I ask you to imagine that you're fish, can you imagine you're fish? I hope you're in the water. Right? We assume that you're in the water. But because you're in the water and you're fish, you don't know anything else until something, someone pulls you out of that water and you gasp. You gasp in the environment that you're not supposed to be in. That fish in the water is free. That's the real freedom. If we know we're spiritual and we already, like the fish, exist in spirit rather than in matter or material law, we will be much freer. That's the truth. And then I was sharing this with my colleague. He said, well, you know, Fujiko, the contemporary of Mary Baker Eddy, Sojourner Truth, said this. God is like the great ocean of love. We live and move in it like the fishes of the sea. Now, this is Sojourner Truth, who was a slave. But what made her say this powerful statement? And she had also, those who followed her, had experienced healing as well. It's her spiritual consciousness, knowing that one mind, the highest intelligence, that we are always living, moving, and having our being in spirit. Nowhere else. That you are free now. And if we know that oneness cannot be taken away from you, because you are that image and likeness that we refer to the very first chapter of Genesis that we live by, that we have that one fountain, that one eye view that's not mixing good and evil, but only having that pure, simple, single view will make us the highest style of man. And with that highest style of man, the concept, what we can practice is science. It's not science that somehow a miss uh, calculated is science that it's universal for everyone, anytime, regardless of the background. So you take that science with you, and remember, you're that beautiful fish swimming in that vast ocean of love. Thank you. <laughs>